Running on Ice, the coolest community in freight. I'm your host, Sydney Edwards, bringing you the latest tech updates, warehouse news, everything happening in the cold chain world. Now, if you know about Running on Ice, the show, you know about Running on Ice, my newsletter that I write every Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and today is no different. So before we get into our guest for the show, let's read up some headlines. Now, New York-based Rosina Foods has officially opened a new production facility in West Seneca, New York. The $73 million build spans 105,000 square feet and will further the company's efforts in producing frozen meatballs, sliced sausage, and other frozen toppings. Food Business Wires, excuse me, Food Business News reports that the high-speed production lines will more than double Rosina's production capacity, allowing for over 50 million pounds of product to be handled. The article goes on to say that this new facility will bring 40 jobs to the area, something that President and CEO Russell Corigliano is happy to do. Corigliano is quoted as saying, this project wouldn't be possible without help from the state of New York. This is the third expansion for Rosina, all with state support. And the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service announced a recall on Purdue Frozen Ready to Eat gluten free chicken tenders. This alert comes after the company received a complaint from a customer that they found a piece of clear plastic with blue dye inside it. The product in question is 42 ounce plastic bags named Purdue Chicken Breast Tenders Gluten Free, with a best if used by date of July 12, 2023. And these items were shipped to BJ's Wholesale Club retail locations nationwide. The FSIS says there have been no reports of adverse reactions. However, folks who have purchased these products are urged not to eat them. These products should be thrown away or returned to the store where they were purchased from. Now let's get to the good stuff. Today I am joined by Angie Tordawa. She is the founder and CEO of Angie's Transportation. Angie, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? I am good. I'm excited to have you on and and learn a lot more about Angie's Transportation. And so I think we should start there. Please tell me, when did things begin and, and how did you really get involved in this? Okay, so um, long story short, me and my brother started this company in November of 2012. We started off with one truck and we have been growing the company ever since. I kind of got my foot in the door by, um, by my dad, actually. So my dad started off as a company driver for Swift, and then he worked his way to the top. He, yeah, that's us right there. <laughs> Um, Yeah, so he worked his way up to the top. He became company driver, owner-operator, independent contractor, and then he had his own company um, when I was growing up, and that was where I had my summer jobs. I was working in every department, just helping out wherever, so I got a really good understanding of the industry, and I was literally born into it and raised in and around it, and then my dad, he's older. He decided he wanted to get out of it. Um, and me and my brother at the time were like, you know what, let's take a shot at this. Let's do it. So then we started our own company, like I said, one truck. Um, and we have about 60, 65 units right now and we're running about 70, 75 trailers as well. And we are, yeah, that's one of our pink trucks. We do have a pink truck. It wouldn't be a woman owned business without <laughs> at least one pink truck. Um, yeah. So, and we've been growing the company ever since, and we're about, Ninety percent refrigerated right now, and the re- the other ten percent is just general dry vans and dry freight. So refrigerated is our bread and butter. It is our specialty. So being a woman in the business, what is your favorite part of the trucking industry? Oh my goodness, um, I love. I mean, every day is different, so I really like that. It's extremely challenging. It's competitive. It, that's what makes it more fun, I think. And I also, you know, I do love when we're meeting with people and people kind of um, initially get a little bit underestimated when they see a girl walking into a meeting, you know, and then I start talking about trucking and, you know, I know my stuff and they're like, they get a little bit shocked. So it's fun to see everyone's first reaction um, when they see me. But then also, I just, I do love that it's um, very competitive and every day is different here and there's so many things going on and it's always changing. So it's it's fun to be on your toes all the time and um, just keep up with everything if you like that. 
So tell me, who does Angie's Transportation typically serve? What markets here? Oh, uh, okay. So we do primarily um, produce. We're really big on produce. Um, we've also been doing a lot of, lately, a lot of seafood, a lot of meat, um, but primarily it's produce. We'll do watermelons, berries, et cetera. Um, but right now the season, it's, it's, we're not in season for that right now. So we're doing a lot of meat and seafood and alcohol as well. And Angie's is out of St. Louis, correct? So where are your trucks going? Yes, we are. We're based right here in smack dab center of the country. Um, our trucks are primarily going to Arizona, California, the West Coast, and they're bringing back, uh, bringing back produce, et cetera, to the Midwest. So, and also, also we're doing um, Texas and Florida too. So we do Texas, Florida, but primarily the West Coast. So California, Arizona, back to the Midwest. I know when we talked, you'd said you typically try to stay away from hauling meat. I know that you've been hauling some meat, but you typically try to stay away from that and frozen items. Why is that? Um, it just takes a toll on the on the reaper units is what we've noticed. It takes a toll on the unit. So that requires, then it requires the unit to be maintenance more often. And also it's, you know, it's, it's, it, those tend to be really heavy loads and long wait times for drivers as well. Perfect. So yeah. when we talked, uh, I kind of randomly had mentioned AV5 and we ended up going on a tangent about it. And so I'd love to get yeah. into it, especially since this week, the injunction that, that kept California's AV life law out of the truck law out of the trucking industry mm -hmm. has just crumbled, um, meaning it is the law of the land. Of course, however, there are some other things jumping on in there. Some people are still trying to move things around. We'll see. But we knew it was probably going to happen. So I'll just ask yeah. you off the bat, what are your thoughts on AB5? I, I hate it. I'm not a supporter of it. I don't agree with it. And I think it's killing the American dream. I'm completely against it. I think I, it's a terrible idea, and I think we are shooting ourselves in the foot here with it. I, we, I have yet to talk to somebody who does support it. I know there is support out there. Otherwise, you know, it, it wouldn't have passed. Yes. Um, it wouldn't I be agree. the way it is now. But yep. when it comes to points that you see in, in the way that this is going to change the industry, what are the, your main concerns? Oh, I have a few concerns, definitely. I think one of those concerns is that we already have a driver shortage in the country, and now we're just limiting ourselves even more. There's going to be companies that are not going to want to hire or be able to hire drivers out of California. So there's going to be all the, there's, it's just going to increase that driver shortage. And then I think it's going to definitely make an impact on freight as well. You know, the ports there in California, we have all this freight coming in. Who's going to pick it up now? It's a really good point you make. I hadn't exactly thought about how, mm -hmm. the influx that we're going to be seeing out of those ports. I guess I just wonder, are all of those people going to, you know, fully sign on in another company, make the W-2 work and, and get, you know, get away from their contract work? Or do you think they're going to be moving to other states necessarily? I think they might be moved. I think there's going to be a mix of both. It's just going to be these trucking companies are just going to have to, you know, learn to adapt and to figure it out. And then I think there will be other dry, other trucking companies that are going to be taking the risk too. And then I think there will be drivers who will be relocating as well. I've seen it. I've seen all three of those examples actually happen recently over the past year um, I've seen drivers relocate from California to Arizona just to be able to become an owner operator or go drive for another company. And then I've seen trucking companies um, just take the risk and continue on with it. And then I've seen other trucking companies say, okay, no, we have to live, learn, and adapt to this. And this, it is what it is. In your circle, in your network, what have you heard from others about the AB5? What what folks' thoughts are, or I don't know if you've heard anything from your own drivers about it. Yes, I mean, I've, I've definitely heard from other companies, and I've heard from some drivers as well. I have not yet met anyone that is for it. Everyone I know is against it. Um, it like I said, it's just extremely limiting, and it's going to take a toll on the market and the freight market and the ports. So 
yeah, I mean, I don't know anyone that is honestly for it. I don't know any trucking company that is. I don't know any driver that is either. In any way, could this impact Angie's, though it's in St. Louis, is there something that you might see an immediate impact of, or do you think it could impact Angie's in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think if one state does this, other states could potentially follow suit. So yeah, it could potentially affect Angie's as well. And then not to mention, we have had a stop hiring out of California as well. We no longer hire um, company drivers, independent contractors, subcontractors, um, whatever it may be. If it's a guy with his own truck or wants to lease one of our trucks, we are just completely staying out of that and kind of trying to figure out our operations as well if we want to continue to do business in California even if we don't have drivers that are residing in California, it is definitely making us um, decide whether or not we should continue to do operations there. And we are definitely not hiring out of there. And it just makes us a little bit more cautious as well. And just moving forward to, you know, trying to stay on top of everything, because if California does this, who knows what next state could do it as well. And it's going to put all these trucking companies in jeopardy. I understand that that's actually a new policy, a newer policy, I should say, um, for your company not hiring California drivers. Can you tell me maybe why that is? You know, of course, it's, it's you know, nothing against the driver themselves, but no, California really. No, absolutely not. It is. It, it, that's what it comes down to. It's absolutely nothing against the driver. I would love for them to come on board here. Absolutely. If they have a safe driving record, why not? I would love to take them on. But it's just, it's too risky. I think us trucking companies already have a massive target on our back. I don't want to increase, you know, our risk and our chances even more so. And do you think other companies look at this the same way you do? I haven't talked to other companies about whether they specifically hire California drivers or not, but I'm sure you've heard from others. Yeah, I would say that we're all pretty much on the same page about this. Um, Definitely trucking companies that are more focused on owner operators and independent contractors that maybe don't do or don't have uh, company drivers, but they're maybe they own equipment and they lease it out or do lease purchases. So I know those driver or those companies are definitely not in favor of this either. And I, you know, this, this 85 is a little ridiculous stating that just because a driver is leasing your truck it, you know, he's not an employee. He's coming on board. He's leasing a truck from your company. He can fuel wherever he wants to. He can take whatever freight he wants to. He's in charge of that himself. He is a small business. He's not an employee. And this is very similar to what we saw with Uber drivers a couple years ago as well. Do you think we're going to be feeling any of those effects sooner rather than later from this? I think we could. Yes, I, I definitely think we could. Like I said, um, you know, drivers are what keep America moving and going. We depend on them for everything. And there's already so many shortages going on that we've seen in the past year and still the effects of COVID we're still seeing. So, yes, absolutely. Now, Angie, you had mentioned before when we had talked um, something that I hadn't exactly heard from from other folks in the industry, but you mentioned specifically immigrant immigrant drivers, folks that are coming in, you know, getting their licenses and wanting to start yeah. careers in trucking. Let's get in a yes. little bit into that. Um, I know that it's something that's maybe hits a little bit more home for you, but let's jump into that yes. topic of, of what that does for those folks that are coming in to start these careers now. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, what most people know, my dad, for example, he immigrated to America in the eighties and He started off as a company driver, and it is one of those jobs that you don't need to have a college degree to get into. It's a more ready and accessible job, and um, that you don't, you're, you know, not necessarily, you do have to know how to read and write English, but it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. And it is a ready and available job, and, um, you know, it just helps increase your financial position and everything. So this is one of the more open jobs. And a lot of, you know, just the demographics of California and Arizona, there are 
Mexican immigrants that are coming from Mexico that this might be their only only job opportunity that they can have to better their lives. So I that's why I say I think this is killing the American dream. We have all these immigrants coming over and this might be one of the only careers that they can really choose to do without speaking um, perfect English or having a college degree and they're trying to better their lives for their family and um, and now they really you know they can't it's just limiting that and that's really unfortunate as well and if I understand correctly when when those folks that are coming in get their CDL it actually can expedite services for them like like getting their green yeah. card and and starting things in their yes. life could you maybe explain that a bit more to me Yes, absolutely. That's a that's a big um, a big thing going on right now that is very popular as well. Since there is a driver shortage in America and the federal law for how old you have to be to get your class A CDL and do interstate commerce and transportation has not been lowered to eighteen. That there, you know, like I said, there's a driver shortage. So a lot of what these companies are doing and these law firms, they are getting creative to try to do um, like a temporary, uh, like a work visa. They're trying to do work visas. I actually am friends with a trucking company that is doing, that is working with a local law firm here in St. Louis that are trying to accomplish the work visas to get immigrants here from Mexico and Canada to provide jobs. So it's, it's going to affect that, you know, um, as we're, we're trying to solve this driver shortage problem. And this California AB5 is not helping that at all. And, you know, becoming an owner operator, that is one of the building blocks to starting your own trucking company. Um, that's usually how it works is a driver becomes a comp gets their class A CDL. They go to driving school. They get that all accomplished and done under their belt. Then they have to start off at one of these big mega carriers because they are self-insured versus a smaller carrier where we have um, a two-year experience rule. So they start off at a mega carrier, and then after they get one to two years down, they can go to any other trucking company after that. And then if they get more experience under the belt, they can become an owner-operator. That would be probably step one after they are an owner-operator and they're leasing equipment or a lease to purchase after they own it outright. They can then, you know, choose to become an independent contractor and open their own authority and get their own insurance. So this is a step and a building block. It's just a part of the process to become 100%, you know, have your own company, own insurance, have your own authority. Um, but it doesn't mean you're an employee still regardless. So... Um, I, I just think this it, this AB5 rule is not looking at the whole perspective of what is going on in America and the process and the steps it does take to start your own trucking company. Do you think that that means there's going to be less startup companies in the future? It seems like, as you mentioned, that that is a big part of, you know, creating your own company starting mm -hmm. off underneath somebody else, maybe that wouldn't really show you how to create your own company or, you know, give you the, the, the push that you need to do that, yes. I guess. Yes, I do, actually. Um, the market, you know, it is very saturated. There's, as you know, there's so many trucking companies out here and so many uh, 3PLs and brokerages. And a lot of these trucking companies or a lot of the freight that is being moved in America, it is by the one-man show. It is by the smaller guys. I would say about probably 70, I think it was like, um, I, I forgot the statistics, but the vast majority of the freight that is being moved across America is the one-man show, is the one owner-operator, independent contractor with his one truck and one trailer. And we're heavily depending on these people and I do understand that, you know, in this market where there's so many of us, but it, it is challenging. Um, the options for getting your own insurance, you don't have many options for that. Um, it, it is tough. Getting your own authority is very difficult. Um, getting your own insurance is very, very difficult. You don't have many options to choose from. I think there's only about one to two insurance carriers that will take a smaller company 
So I do feel like, you know, slowly they're trying to, they're kind of trying to push out the little guys and it's hurt. It's terrible. It's hurting small businesses. You know, like I said, killing the American dream, it's hurting small businesses. And I think it's extremely unfair and we're not giving anyone an opportunity here. Going back to the immigrant situation, it also seems like this might be a way to push out immigrants that are trying to create those jobs, the American dream, as you mentioned, here in the mm -hmm. United States, um, just across those borders and trying to start a life here. I know there's a lot going into yep. this law, but that seems like it could be a facet to it as well. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I, yeah, I agree with that too. It's, it's unfortunate. Like I said, um, it's just hurting small businesses and, and that's it. And there's just, there's enough freight to go around for everyone right now. And until someone finds a different solution, this is where we're at, but there is enough freight to go around for everyone. And, um, I think it would be incredibly hard to have a monopoly over everything, over all the freight in America. But that is kind of what I'm seeing this push come to, you know, this push I'm seeing with this law. And then there's, like I said, there's already, there's already limited options for insurance. There's already so many limited options. It's hard to get financing, uh, limited options, banks, financing, et cetera, to buy your own truck. Um, so, it is, it's hard. So that's why, you know, I say it's unfortunate, it's unsad, and it's hurting businesses and the people that have this dream of wanting to start their own trucking company. Have you had the chance to talk to your dad about this? I'm just curious. I have. I have had a chance to talk to him about this. We talk about trucking all day, every day <laughs> here. Um, it's, a, it's a family business, of course, and we love what we do. We've been doing it our whole lives. So yes, we do talk about it. And we have talked about it, and he is not in favor of it either. I'm curious how things would be different for, for you and your family had this, you know, happened way back when. Yes. And I, you know, I was talking to my dad about that, and he said, you know, Angie, it's it's hard regardless. It's a hard job. Regardless if you are a company driver, an owner-operator, independent contractor, whatever, you want to um, classify yourself as whatever that is, uh, regardless, it, it's a hard job. And if you are wanting to take the next steps and take more responsibility and, you know, start your own business, um, he's like, you have to be pretty brave to do that. And you, there shouldn't be things stopping you from doing that. Angie, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we let you go, tell me what is happening that's new with Angie's Transportation. What do you guys have in store? Oh, my goodness, so much. We're currently in the process of building our new terminal headquarters here in St. Louis, Missouri, and that will include a warehouse. So we will be back into warehousing, cross-docking. We will have a new fancy driver lounge dedicated to all of our drivers, um, that will include, you know, uh, a workout facility, um, washers, dryers. The drivers can do their laundry, break rooms, classrooms, etc. And then just new offices for us and outdoor storage and parking that we are so excited about. And I cannot wait. We didn't. You didn't mention the the driver lounge. I'm so excited for that myself. <laughs> yes, yes. It's um, it's a big deal. We've dedicated. It's going to be a, a two story office with a warehouse attached to it. And the whole downstairs, we have decided to dedicate to drivers. The whole upstairs is dedicated to our office and the whole downstairs will be dedicated to our drivers, which will have 24 seven access to go in and out of the building. If they are making a late delivery at night, if you know they wanna take a shower, if they don't live in St. Louis and they wanna do some laundry, whether it's 1 a.m. or 8 a.m. on a Friday, um, they will have 24-7 access to it, and it's it's great. We I can't wait, and I, I can't wait for my drivers to see it as well. I know you also have new trucks, new reefer units that you're putting in. They're Thermo King units. You've got semi-new yes. ones now, but these are the biggest, best ones that are on the market right now for Thermo King. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. So right now, we are not running anything older 
truck wise, uh, we just got rid of the last 2018. So we're not running anything older than a 2019. We've already got 2023 trucks um, in. We've got a ton more coming in. And then our reefers as well, we're running the Thermo King C600 units. And those are actually that you see um, California compliant for some are five years, some are seven years. And I mean, those are the best on the market right now. And we don't have anything older than a 2018 when it comes to the refrigerated units as well. And we've got a ton of the 2023 ones in already and they're beautiful. Perfect, Angie. Thank you so much for joining me today. I will be checking in Absolutely. with you and I'm just excited that you got to meet with me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy this was great. Um, thank you so much. Of course. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the show, I will have Running on Ice, the newsletter, tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern. Check it out there for more with Andy's Transportation and more on what's coming up next week.